the lost tribes of Israel. Lost? Really? Welcome to a special edition of Revealing the Truth. My name is David Brett and I'm here today with special guest Roger Norman. Roger Norman is a retired lawyer having practiced estate planning law in the state of Texas for 43 years. He is a 1962 graduate of the University of Oklahoma with a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration and a 1968 graduate of the University of Texas School of Law. Mr. Norman received Yahshua as his personal savior at the age of 29 and after first hearing about the Lost Tribes of Israel in the 1970s and examining such to a minor degree, Mr. Norman completely rejected the theory that holds today the Lost Tribes constitute the leading nations of the world. In approximately the year 2000, Mr. Norman began to see the scriptures as opened to him by the Holy Spirit, that the biblical message or the blessings spoken upon the sons of Jacob, Israel, could only apply to the modern nations of this world, and in particular, the United States and Great Britain as having the major blessings. He began to study the subject in much detail and checked out every book he could find, both pro and con, on the subject at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. After becoming thoroughly convinced of the subject he is now going to share with you, he began to teach and share these precepts with others. He has taught a 12-hour course on the Lost Tribes of Israel through the Continuing Education Department of Texas Christian University, Fort Worth, Texas, and has taught a six-hour presentation at a Feast of Tabernacles gathering. The following presentation will run for approximately two hours in an eight-segment, eight uh, four-part series. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Roger Norman. Thank you so much, David. And let's think about the lost tribes of Israel. Are they really lost? Lawson Younger, writing in Biblical Archaeology Review, says that the story of the Israelites is fairly simple. They were captured by the Assyrians, deported the final, uh, final ones around 722 B.C. And hey, uh, that's the last we hear of them. They were never heard from again. End of story. That's simple. But the Jewish Encyclopedia brings out an interesting uh, point, and that is if the ten tribes have disappeared, then the literal fulfillment of the prophecy, speaking of their return, would be impossible. If they have not disappeared, obviously they must exist under a different name. And I think we'll see today that we do exist right under our noses. You'll remember that the captivities occurred by the uh, final captivities by the Assyrians around 734 B.C. Uh, around 13,000 were kept, held, uh, carried away captive. Uh, 13 years later, 721 B.C. around 27,000. Total of 40,810,000 uh, were carried away captive by the Assyrians. And yet, 250 years earlier, during the time of King David and King Solomon, David had an army of 1,567,000. The Bible records that in Solomon's time, the tribes were innumerable. And yet, 250 years later, only 40,000. Hey, what happened? Well, let's look, first of all, why were these Israelites chosen or selected in the first place? You'll remember that after creation, mankind is falling apart. Violence fills the land. So the flood is, uh, takes away the violence and mankind begins uh, anew under Noah and his family. And now, a little while later, here comes the Tower of Babel. Well, what's Yahweh to do? Mankind's in effect told him, hey, shove off. Well, he's got some options. He can select trustworthy trustees, so to speak, as a lawyer would say, to care for mankind, or he can shove off. Well, whom could he trust? There's Abraham and Sarah who trusted Yahweh, so Yahweh could trust them with something mankind desperately needed. What was that? 
blessings. Look up the definition in your dictionary. To make holy by religious right, to invoke divine favor upon, give honor and glory to, con to confer well-being or prosperity upon. Again, something mankind desperately needs. More definitions to protect against evil or harm. Abraham, I'm going to bless you to take that to others. And we see in Genesis 12 the love of Yahweh for mankind. Now, Yahweh said to Abram, I will make you a great nation, bless you, make your name great. Why? And so you shall be a blessing, and in you all, not some, but all the families of the earth will be blessed. And I've checked out these verb tenses on these uh, blessings, and they're, uh, once they kick in, they're ongoing, continuing verb tenses that just carry right on up through uh, the present and to the future. Abraham the Hebrew. The word Hebrew comes from the name of Eber, the father, forefather of Abraham. And it means to cross over. And keep in mind the pronunciation, Eber, Eber, it's going to be important as we trace these Hebrews in their migrations as they cross over from one place to another. Sarah, his wife, her name means princess. Yes, I, Yahweh says, have blessed her and she'll become nations. That's uh, the Hebrew word goim, which is often used of Gentiles. Kings of people shall come from her. Therefore, we want to look for her descendants among those who will have and exercise dominion. Yahweh's response to Abraham's test when he said, Ab when he said Abraham, go offer your son Isaac, Abraham was willing. He trusted Yahweh. Then Yahweh says, I'll bless you and multiply you, your seed as the stars of heaven, and, and your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. Extremely important. Why? Because you've obeyed me, Abraham, I can entrust this blessing to you of possessing the gates of your enemies. The Hebrew word for gate, uh, sha'ar, opening, like a door. And in the old days, who controlled the gates of the city controlled who went in and out. Today we want to look for these gates or openings or doors of technology, education, understanding, finances, military might, military bases, and surveillance as we trace these tribes. Isaac, their son, but Elohim said to Abraham, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named or called, and that's the Hebrew word kara, which means to call by name, and name, Shem, means an appellation or character as well as name. Appellation to appeal to a higher power for something. And we want to look for that, uh, for some, that uh, appellation to be appealing to the higher power to carry out the character traits of these names and their descendants. Isaac married Rebekah, twin sons Esau and Jacob. Esau, you're the firstborn, you're entitled to the birthright with all its blessings. Esau could care less. Man, he sold out for a bowl of beans. Jacob, he valued it greatly. He went after it, he bought it, and he acquired that blessing. And what a wonderful blessing it was. The dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, an abundance of grain and wine. So we want to look for grain and wine exporters. Peoples will serve you. Nations will bow down to you. And that's one way we can spot them also. And that's just one of the many blessings. Then you remember that Esau is wanting to kill Jacob, so he takes off at the uh, uh, direction of his parents. And he has this dream. And, uh, and Yahweh tells him, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You'll spread out to the west, the east, the north, and the south. And you're, go you're going to be a blessing to those in the earth. Implication, I need a lot of you and your descendants to be around the earth. And this blessing of spreading out to the, uh, around the world was given before he ever had any sons or daughters that did good or bad. Then you remember that he uh, became, uh, that he married, in effect, four wives, twelve sons, one daughter. Judah, one of the sons from whom came the Jews, was only one of the twelve. Keep that in mind. On the way back to the uh, homeland, Jacob returns from Mesopotamia, and he wrestles with the angel of Yahweh. And he says to that angel, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. The angel did, in effect, bless him. What was the blessing? He changed this name from Jacob to Israel. Israel means to rule and reign as El himself, as Elohim himself. So we want to look for peoples and nations that rule and reign. Another blessing later at Bethel, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And that word nations, again, is the Hebrew word goim, which is often translated as Gentiles. One of the sons, Joseph, 
was sold into slavery by, uh, well, actually his nine brothers planned to kill him at first, but then he was rescued from death by Reuben, the firstborn. Reuben will trace him. He was an intercessor. He saved Joseph's life, but he had a lack of self-control. He had sex with his stepmother. Bad deal. And he forfeited his inheritance right. The law of the land back then and in many places today allows uh, a disinheritance um, uh, for children and no, fair, no forced airship law. Keep that in mind. Watch for it as we trace Reuben. Joseph, great character. His dreams, his brothers would bow down to him. So we can expect to see his descendants, Joseph, uh, uh, among leaders in the nation. Then they migrated to Egypt, the family, and uh, after uh, Joseph's, uh, uh, Jacob's death, uh, the uh, brothers were thinking, man, he's going to wipe us out. But he says, no, Yahweh sent me down here to preserve many people alive. And then Jacob, or Israel, gives the blessing to the two sons of Joseph. Elohim blessed the lads, and may my name, my character, be named on or live on in them. And the names or the character of my fathers Abraham and Jacob, and, into, and they be, may they go into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So, and if you really want to bless someone, as he, as Jacob uh, gave the blessing to those, to uh, Ephra, Ephraim and Manasseh, may Elohim make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So we want to look for uh, peoples who, and countries who others want to be like. Then Jacob, or Israel, adopted Ephraim and Manasseh, and uh, he uh, placed, uh, so in effect we have 13 tribes. Then in 1 Chronicles 5, very important, now the sons of Reuben were, etc., but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of who? Joseph, i.e. Ephraim and Manasseh. That's where the major birthright blessings passed to. Through, though Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, i.e. Joshua, the kingly line, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. Then you remember the Exodus, and a mixed multitude came out. And that's the picture or type for back then and for today. Come on, let's all go to the promised land, all the peoples of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white. We're precious in His sight. Let's go to the promised land. Yahweh is not willing that any should perish. Character traits of these uh, tribes during the uh, 40 years in the wilderness, complainers, unthankful, litigious, reject a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Yahweh in favor of an intermediary, and hey, some things just don't change. We can look see that today. Then they received the Ten Commandments, and you know what they thought about them. Nothing's changed today. The final blessing of Moses, blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you. Your enemies will cringe before you, and you will tread upon their high places. Again, identifying blessings we'll be able to see. In the last days, the Bible prophesies that all the tribes will be present on the earth and indicated by their character phrase. None will fade out. None will die out. So in summary, were they lost? Don't think so. Why were they chosen? Bless others. Why was Abraham selected trustworthy? Blessings, wonderful definitions. Primary blessings from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph and his two sons. The exodus of mixed multitude were all welcome. Yet the population had an innumerable amount down to only 40,000 some odd. What happened? We'll see in the next section. Fascinating subject. We'll be right back. <laughs> the appointed times or feasts of Leviticus chapter 23 were kept in the Old Testament, were kept in the New, and will be kept in the coming kingdom. The question is, why would we not keep them now? To learn more, request your free in-depth study entitled Biblical Holy Days. Write to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri 65262 or visit us online at yaiy.org. You may also call toll-free 1-877-642-4101. There are so many distractions today. The internet, television, uh, these type of things, taking us away from the Word of Yahweh, in which we should be uh, spending time in, reading the Word, and finding out what we should be doing as a people. Find out more at yaiy.org. Welcome back. We're here with Roger Norman, and as we're finding out, the lost ten tribes of Israel are not necessarily so lost. 
That's correct. And let's look now at part two, Israel's rise to greatness and their explorations. Genesis 28, Yahweh tells Jacob, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, spreading out to the west, east, north, and south. And this is before he had any family that had done anything good or bad. The tribe of Dan, Judges 18, they're on the move early after, after they cross into the Promised Land. Judges 5, uh, there's a big battle led by Deborah, and Deborah says, why did Dan stay in ships? Implication, that, hey, our cousins should have been here helping with the battle, and there they are off sailing around the ships. Well, the Britannica uh, records that the Greeks listed the Danans as a seafaring people who were present in the Mediterranean in the 1200 to 1100 BC period, and that's the same time frame that the judges were in Israel. But the point being, they're already taking off from, from the land. Now, during this uh, early time, there were uh, three major uh, kings uh, under the, through which the United Kingdom uh, existed, Saul, David, and Solomon. Keep these dates in mind, especially as we uh, go through and pin down events to these dates. Uh, King Solomon, of course, being when things were at their height there in Israel. King David had an army of a million, uh, 500,000 plus soldiers. And First Chronicles states that Israel had a uh, a million one hundred thousand soldiers and Judah four hundred and sixty seven thousand. So the point being that even do, under the United Kingdom, the amalgamation or merger of Israel, the northern ten, and Judah, the southern two tribes, was shaky at best. Then Israel defeated Assyria, uh, Mesopotamian Empire, and in effect became a world power. And that's recorded there in uh, First Chronicles. And uh, Collier's Encyclopedia records that during this time, the Assyrians went into a state of confusion, so to speak. And why? Well, Israel had, uh, in effect, taken over as the world power. Historical record of Israel's greatness? Well, you won't find it as such unless we know where to look. Let's look at the Phoenicians, so-called. Who were they? Well, they came to prominence during the time of David and Solomon. And uh, Lionel Casson in his book says, their name is a puzzle. Their land, though, was Canaan. And their language? Hebrew. Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, Americana, the name Phoenicians was given by the Greeks to the inhabitants of the coastal region of Lebanon and the adjacent shores of Israel and Syria. No evidence exists they ever called themselves by that such name. So we want to look at these uh, uh, nations. Uh, they're speaking here about the land right here on the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, a lot of which was the modern day land of Israel. Dr. Cyrus Gordon, Brandeis University. Herodias tells us that these Phoenicians came from the Red Sea. He continues, the Phoenicians lived of old, so they say about the Red Sea, and they came out of there and settled in that part of Syria that is next to the sea, that piece of Syria, in all as far as Egypt is called Palestine. Who does that sound like? Who literally came out of the Red Sea? The Israelites. He continues, their quest for metals uh, led them and Hiram, the king of the city-states, and Solomon to launch expeditions where? To the ends of the earth. And the Bible records that their fleets sent out would take up to three years. That, and of course it took Magellan three years to circumvent the globe. There was one trade uh, or, or one branch uh, of their uh, uh, trade uh, which they uh, uh, clung to with extreme tenacity, and that was in Cornwall, England. Why? That's where their tin trade was, and they wouldn't let the Romans get there. Tin was used to make their implements of, of armor and uh, tools that they used. John Mitchell, we know that the Phoenicians were masters of almost all the nations of where? Europe. And again, I contend these Phoenicians were primarily the Israelites. They sailed in the times of David and Solomon, he says, upon the Mediterranean. And they introduced everywhere the sciences, particularly navigation, astronomy, the letters in the coast of Ireland were known to them. A 1676 author records that the Phoenicians for the, are the first antiquities of this nation, great, speaking of Great Britain, to be derived. And their voyages here may be proved by the best of authorities. And their, their language? Hebrew. They had colonies. And here's this name again, Iberia, Iberus, Iber, as we trace the migration of those Hebrews. King David's global preparations for the Temple of Elohim. He's, uh, in First Chronicles it records that with great pains I have provided for the house of Yahweh. And bronze and iron beyond weighing. Question, 
where did that bronze and copper come from? Dr. Cyrus, uh, Dr. Barry Fell, professor at Harvard University, now deceased, in his book, Bronze, bronze Age America, speaking of the Great Lakes area, writes, there are also reasons for thinking that ancient European voyagers, and I contend they were uh, Phoenicians, came to America. And there's a baffling mystery as to about this mining, uh, in the mining technology field, about these mines up around the uh, shores of Lake Superior, where approximately 5,000 uh, 5, ancient copper mine workings remain. Charcoal found there indicates that they were dated to 2000 to 1000 BC, 1000 BC being our period that we're interested in. It, Dr. Fell continues, the most conservative estimates by mining engineers showed that at least 500 million pounds of copper were removed during that time span, and get this, there is no evidence of what became of it. Hey, copper pots and pans don't just disappear over time. Betty Sauters, in her book, writing about this phenomena, says that during the height of the Phoenician Empire, and that's the time period of incident, and copper was used more extensively than any in time. In time. I submit it was King David taking that copper. King Solomon's global Phoenician empire, First Kings, he built a fleet of ships. Hiram furnished uh, uh, his servants, co-partner uh, co with uh, Solomon, and uh, took off sailing around the world. America's Stonehenge, you can see this on the, the maps of uh, uh, states, uh, and, uh, there, uh, of, of the state there in New Hampshire. And I've been there, and uh, they had these uh, ancient uh, folks had these stones set up indicating when the uh, spring ex equinox would be and the fall equinox would be. And right in the middle there was an altar. And look what was found there, this uh, uh, artifacts. And it, the, it reads, in Baal, on behalf of the Canaanites, is dedicated. Found right there in New Hampshire. Dr. Fell dates it to approximately 800 to 600 B.C. And those dates mark the widespread Baal worship in Israel and the decline of Israel and the Phoenician city-states. The language during that time, Phoenician, Hebrew, Egyptian, Liberian, question, yeah, you remember that Solomon married an Egyptian uh, uh, daughter of Pharaoh. They evidently had a, an alliance there. And there's a stele that's been found here near Davenport, Iowa, and it contained, it seems clear that a Dr. Fell says that these folks were in America during that period of time. There's a depiction of it. Three languages. They all say the same thing, by the way, the three languages. The Los Lunas, our New Mexico uh, stone, the uh, Decalogue stone it's called, contains the Ten Commandments in abbreviated form. And guess what? They're all in ancient Paleo Hebrew, uh, a, a, a writing style that died out about 2,500 years ago. It uses the name of Yahweh. It is written in Hebrew letters with a style of about 1,000 B.C. It was not translated until 1949 by Dr. Robert Feifler, professor at Harvard University. There's a photograph of it, and yours truly. Here's a close-up, again, written in ancient Paleo-Hebrew. Here we see the name of Yahweh. Yod, He, Vav, He, reading from the right to the left. And right below it in the next line, again, the name of Yahweh, Yod, He, Vav, He. Now, watch this. Here is the Hebrew Lamed in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew. Their L, it's exactly our L of today. Here is the Hebrew Aleph, which is our A laying on its side with extended arms. Now, you know where our, our, a lot of our letters come from. The uh, Americana states that uh, about 1000 B.C., Phoenicia suddenly developed uh, when a, a accel uh, the, uh, culture accelerated. And the Britannica, the history of our own alphabet, which has survived as an alphabet sur with surprisingly little, uh, surprisingly little changes for nearly 3,000 years, demonstrates that it, uh, it's great need for many languages. Well, hey, how did the Greeks obtain it from the Semites? The most important fact ignored by any theory that would deprive the Greek and the Phoenician alphabets independently, in other words, they did not derive independently, is that the names of the letters, as far as they are known, have a known meaning, are Semitic. The Hebrew Aleph, Beth, Gemal, Delet, for example, correspond unmistakably with the Greek Aleph, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. 
the most important intellectual invention of man, that is the, uh, uh, that of letters, was asserted by the Greeks and the Romans to have been communicated by, these, uh, to the, by the Phoenicians to the Greeks. Phoenician has been shown again to be almost identical to Hebrew. In fact, it is in my opinion. Dr. Uh, Prof historian George Rollison, the, the historians carried the civilizing influence of the letters wh wherever they traded. An enormous advance must everywhere have followed the introduction of writing due to these Phoenicians, i.e. Israelites in my opinion. Per, uh, Philip Hittite, the Phoenician trade on an international scale in textiles, metals, etc., gave the uh, country three centuries, beginning around 1000 B.C., time of King Solomon, of prosperity unmatched in its history. And that the technology suddenly developed indicates that there was a genius. And who was that genius? Behind it, the Bible tells us it was Solomon. Yahweh's promise, Genesis 22, to Abraham, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And during the reign of Solomon, all nations were literally blessed with a time of world peace, scientific knowledge, international commerce, and invention of the alphabet. King Solomon, and now, O Yahweh, Elohim, thy promise to my father David is fulfilled, for thou hast made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. But 250 years later, down to only 40,810, what happened? So in summary, they were on the move early out of the Promised Land, actually within 200 years of crossing the Jordan. The Bible records an expanding and a great kingdom under David and Solomon. They partnered with King Hiram and the city-states of Tyre and Sidon to become known as the Phoenicians. Who were they predominantly, in my opinion, the Israelites? And we'll take up for the next section. It's a fascinating, fascinating topic, and we'll look closer at the lost tribes of Israel and their history, and the future, I think, we'll examine as well next time on Revealing the Truth.